Well, I was very fortunate. When I came to Canada, Calgary and Southern Alberta in particular was booming. There was lots of work and compensation was reasonable. We actually got what we called the 1969 collective agreement. And it within itself was a very progressive agreement. That's when we really moved ahead on the health and welfare and pension. We introduced the seven and a half hour day into the construction industry. When I started in 1973, there was very little that wasn't union. Certainly all the commercial work and pipelines and certainly all the industrial. But when the 1980s came along, boy, the whole world changed. The Arabs lowered the price of oil. The whole world economy and the oil industry went, went to hell. Here in Alberta, of course, there's no work now because you can get a barrel of oil for $15 a barrel back then. Work started to uh, come down and, and jobs were closed up on street level and cranes came down and jobs were stopped midstream and what began was a very difficult time for the 80s for construction workers. It went from boom to bust overnight and when it busted the contractors believed that they could get a better deal. There was, there was more people than there was jobs. Of course when there's tough times there are people that are willing to cut corners, go back to work, you know. And so the ones in power are able to take advantage of that. They sold a bill of goods to the trade union movement in 1984, that if you take a rollback and all this stuff, we'll have all this work. All it did is roll back everybody's wages, and we still didn't have work. It really came down fast. And uh, like a lot of people, I lost, uh, lost the condo I was living in, went through a divorce. It basically broke everybody's back. Like there was cases where a man with his wife and say two kids, he'd have to leave her planet to leave her and live where, where he couldn't eat so she could apply for welfare to feed the kids. The contractors saw the work turning down and they were looking to, they said, to compete. They said that our collective agreements were too expensive and they couldn't compete with the non-union. Some devious lawyer somewhere had figured out that, uh, you know, if we just terminate the agreements uh, overnight, then essentially the relationship's still there, but there's no collective bargain agreement. June the 16th of 1984, they locked all the trade unions out. Plumbers, electricians, carpenters, of course. Overnight, they got legislation changed by the Alberta government. It was called the 24-hour lockout. The Alberta government just allowed our contractors to uh, fold up the shop 24 hours later to open up a non-union shop and turn to their employees and say, well, we're a different company now. We're XYZ company, and if you want to work for us, you're going to have to take a, a cut in wages and no, you won't get the benefits you did before. Uh, I figured it out to be 65% cut overnight to our benefit uh, wage package. All told, 65% cut overnight. Devastating to anybody that had a mortgage, anybody that had a car payment, anybody that had a family, such as me. It really broke open the industry as we knew it. This is not by accident. There was a clearly executed strategic plan to ensure that the building trade unions in this province would never ever have the monopoly again in our industry. It was so hard that they made you fight the bulldog and they buried you up to your neck in sand and you weren't allowed to bite. If you tried to bite the bulldog, they hit you with a briefcase full of anti-labor legislation and told you to fight fair. There was a group who decided that they weren't going to work in non-union. They were going to, no matter what, they decided they were going to put up a pretty good fight. We had our political action committees in most of the building trades halls and we'd meet the electricians hall 424. It was a packed committee discussing all the issues. From there, we learned that there was other locals getting together, talking about the same things, brothers and sisters talking about the same things. So we said, well, why not, why not come together and we'll, we'll all meet? And that's where the dandelion thing kind of started. Pete showed up one Monday morning and he said he'd been out cutting his grass or digging up dandelions in his backyard and he thought that that would be a good symbol for the political action committee. We needed a symbol to rally around and the dandelion is us. Grassroots, you can't kill a dandelion, they've been trying for years, you know, and we're the same way. We're the salt of the earth. 
We're just like that, that flower, eh? And we took it as our symbol because it can't be overrun, tramped on. Like you can do all those things to it, but it keeps coming back. And that's a, that's a message, a symbolic message. We're going to keep coming back till we win. It seemed the symbol itself sparked something. When you're unemployed and you have no work and your family's starving, you can sit at home and mope about it and get depressed. But if somebody phones you up and say, hey, listen, come help us. Let's go after the people that put us in this position. But I think after these double-digit uh, unemployment figures, there's a change coming. So we've got to go to all these meetings. We've got to read these papers again. Anytime one of these uh, rinky-dink, two-bit, uh, decorated dandies that they've got there as cabinet ministers make a statement, we should be approaching the press with a counter statement. We made sure these politicians had a look at the face of the unemployed, not just the men, but there was wives and children. We became like a self-help group. We're like therapy for each other, you know? Some guys that never thought they could speak started speaking, you know? Some you couldn't shut up, you know? <laughs> but it was good. We just had each other kind of thing and we stuck together on that. We'd organize a number of dances, get-togethers, and everybody chipped in. I remember the uh, hotel and culinary workers donating the cook. It was good, honest fun. The guy was homeless, lived in some kind of shack, and a shack burnt down. So we decided to help him. You've got to realize, these guys are all from the building trades. There's a lot of talent there. A guy by the name of Clarence Cavanaugh, a carpenter, and they built a nice little 8x10 or whatever, eh? Balcony on it, porch, the works, put a gas stove inside, a heater, and told the guy, do not light that stove. Don't light the stove. He went in there, I guess he got into his cups one night, went into the cabin, lit the stove, and blew the door off. I just blew him. <laughs> blew him outside the works, eh? So, yeah, we... Boys put on a new door again, uh, give it another paint job. Every week we had a meeting, even from El Salvador and Iran, different guys that were from there came and spoke to us and showed us that there is a movement throughout the whole world against the working man. You know, we started to realize that, hey, this is, this is not right what's going on, and we just started to speak up. It's interesting to know how much effect a small, unemployed bunch of tradespeople but we'd make a little noise and uh, we scared the hell out of them. We got a message for uh, Les Young and uh, Premier Getty this morning. Well, it's, it certainly doesn't put the Conservative Party in good light with us, with any of the unemployed. They just don't, they don't care about us. This, this, this is the experience that we've gone through ourselves. We're being pushed under the rug. We're being ignored. We're thrown on the ash heap. Up until the early 80s, nobody had ever really looked at this government as being either anti-labor or pro-labor. But clearly, once the lockout started to happen, I think the writing was on the wall about which positions this provincial government was taking. We didn't have a real political ideology in that we weren't a communist, we weren't, uh, we weren't liberals. We weren't just building trades. We had a lot of other unemployed people involved. We made a lot of connections with a lot of other groups. But we remained grassroots. We remained true to the grassroots. We knew who the enemy was, and we uh, organized real quick. Peter Law, he'd bragged, we're open to everybody, so we have these townhouse meetings. Well, we took advantage of that. We swamped those things. And we'd show up at, 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 with our little green hats and our flowers, and we'd ask a question of the, of the politician. And they would give their answer, the politician's answer, and we said, no, you didn't answer the question. And we'd just hold their feet to the fire and try to get the straight goods on them. You know, why do you have unemployment? You've got this huge uh, fund put away for a rainy day. Well, it's pouring. So what their reaction was after many of these meetings turned into a bear pit, they shut them down. As far as politically lobbying, well, we sat in at the gallery. We sat in on the cafeteria. We embarrassed them. I can remember walking in on um, political conventions. In fact, I can remember a convention in Calgary when Peter Lawhey was in full voice at the Calgary Convention Center, and we were, I don't know how many hundred of us there were with placards, and, uh, and we went right through the convention hall as he was a mid-sentence on the microphone. 
And I don't, I think these people in attendance at this event didn't know whether to laugh or shout or um, clap. I mean, it was just never been seen before. And you're also saying to those politicians, come on, wake up, understand what's going on to me and my family. We were prepared to do pretty much whatever, to be out there and uh, be seen and take our struggle to the streets. I mean, arguably that's what we were doing, taking the struggle to the streets. It was like a release valve, eh? At least you could get back at them. Y'all see this gentleman sitting here? We don't want to end up like that, sitting on this park bench and turned to stone. So far, the system here, the government, they've taken our health and our wealth. But they better not screw around with our dignity. That's the whole thing with us. At the time, Brian Mulroney was holding Alberta up as this wonderful conservative Valhalla. Well, he has this big meeting out there at the Red Barn, north of Edmonton. And uh, he doesn't realize, Mulroney doesn't, and neither does Lawhee, that it's full of dandelions. So when uh, Brian Mulroney gets up to speak, everybody shouted him down by hollering, BS, BS, BS. And uh, it embarrassed him. Yes, Brian, I met him sod turning ceremony at Canada Place, and he's coming by, and I grabbed his hand, and I pulled him. He had the patent leather shoes on. It was November, and he slid on the ice, and I pulled him to me, and I went to reach in my pocket, see? And they thought I had a gun. It was my black toque. <laughs> he grabbed, grabbed my arm to security. <laughs> oh, yeah. Barbara Frum at that time had her part in the CBC National News. They come to me. What do you think of the trickle-down theory? I kind of laughed and I said, trickle-down theory? I said, when I hear that, I duck for cover because it's warm, wet, and amber-colored. Anytime you do something like that and go against the powers that be, they red-bait you, call you a communist. We survived it, but we definitely didn't have support from the unions. We yeah. did it from the pipe fitters a bit and the carpenters. Iron workers were more or less neutral. They were okay. They weren't ready for it. You know, they weren't ready for it. Unions, for the most part, are very small C conservative. They don't want to really make any waves, whatever. But that's what's needed right now: is waves have to be made. You have to kick. You have to kick. You have to buck. It's it's got to happen. We have one minister who just last December said that the dandelions are going to fade away. Because in 1986, everything is going to be sunshine and roses. Well, the fact of it is that in 1986, things are not sunshine and roses. And the other fact is the dandelions are damn well not going to go away. We got to be proud and we got to be loud. Stand up. Stand up. It sort of always comes back to the power of the people. And give everybody a task, and people can dream again. That's what the dandelions taught us, is to stick together with your other trades. Plumbers and pipe fitters, carpenters, painters, cement masons, iron workers, everybody across this province then started to feel a sense of unity that we were one. And I think that was the key to getting, I believe it was 1986, 16, DP MLAs we elected. The grassroots, the average working person or the average citizen doesn't know the power he has. We 